Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see everyone here at the end of the first day. I know it's been kind of long. I'm going to try to keep this concise so that we do have time for questions. I'm really excited to be here. So let's get started. My name is Gray Reinhardt, and for the last three years, I've been working with the Baptal Education Empowerment Program. And I was really excited to join this program three years ago because I wanted to work with a grassroots organization. Um, and it was a 10-month residential, non-formal higher education program. So as was mentioned by Ms. Lay, it is, it's very unique. Um, I was very excited to teach 20 young adults of the ethnic Mon state in Myanmar who come from rural and remote areas. And I was excited to be teaching a dynamic critical thinking and language arts curriculum. But the thing that I was most excited and enthusiastic about was the pre-service teacher training component of the program. I was so enthusiastic that I got the opportunity, or I was going to get the opportunity, to train these young adults to return to their communities, the remote and rural communities in southeastern Myanmar, to be intern teachers for two years in a parallel education system which is to say an education system that's operated by an ethnic Mon education entity. So it's not the basic education system of Myanmar. It's a parallel education system that has 136 schools in rural and remote areas of southeastern Myanmar. Now, having worked in the Myanmar context before, I was aware of the statistics about how the student dropout rate in Myanmar had fewer than 30% of students making it from kindergarten through grade one. And how just a mere 10% of students pass the high school matriculation exam each year. Now, I, I also knew that while livelihood concerns were the main pull, the main pull responsible for dropout, I also understood that other concerns played a role in pushing students out of education, including a lack of infrastructure to access middle schools and high schools, uh, limited school resources, schools without walls, or schools that are maybe lacking a roof, and a lack of quality teachers. So I was really, really committed to improving the quality of the teachers through pre-service teacher training, such that regardless of the school conditions and resource needs, students would still be receiving valuable, interactive, and meaningful education. However, those three years ago, I quickly realized that the curriculum of our non-formal higher education program was geared more towards critical thinking and English language arts, which is to say that only about 20% of the total curriculum in this 10-month program was for teacher training. Um, so I decided that it needed further development, and I therefore took it upon myself to update and upgrade the teacher training curriculum, guided by the belief that active learning plus reflective teaching results in quality education. So I called some learning theory and best teaching practices, including teacher competencies uh, adapted from the Myanmar Ministry of Education. And I took all these from a variety of resources and added them to the curriculum. Moreover, I extended our teaching practicum from just one intensive week in the field to weekly sessions over nine months. I made this a priority so that our student teachers would have more experience applying the pedagogy they'd be learning, and subsequently, more opportunity to reflect upon their experiences, developing a reflective mindset that was mentioned earlier, that I believe is so incredibly important for new teachers. Now, these improvements were not made overnight. As I've said at the beginning, I've been there for three years, so I've had some time to make these improvements. They were made incrementally, and instrumentally, such that now we offer a strong in-class active learning component in conjunction with nine months of weekly reflective teaching practicum 
that better produces confident teachers prepared to deliver quality education. Now, although the improvements to the teacher training curriculum were substantial and critical, I believe it is our ongoing field experience, which is illustrated in the right. Our teaching practicum that prepares our student teachers to deliver higher quality education. And to strengthen this practicum, I took what my colleague Christy Lay had begun and I continued it through a framework that makes use of the gradual release of responsibility. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, has anyone here, show of hands, ever heard of this term, the gradual release of responsibility? Please raise your hand if you've heard of it. Okay, just a few. Great. Then I've got some explaining to do. So our teacher training practicum uses Pearson and Gallagher's GRR, Gradual Release of Responsibility Framework, wherein, true to the name, responsibility is gradually released from the teacher to the learner. In this case, from the teacher trainer to his student teachers over a nine-month period teaching practicum. As you'll see, this framework is scaffolded and it makes use of Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Now, the zone of proximal development is that area between too easy, I can do this unaided, and too difficult, I can't do this at all. It's sort of like the porridge in the story Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's in the middle, it's just right. We wanna find that area that is just right wherein a task is given such that the learner is able to do it with the support and guidance of the teacher or a person with more skill and experience. Now this results in the student afterwards being able to do that task unaided. So in our case, our teaching practicum works to push students into their zone of proximal development with their teaching, acknowledging that at first they will need guidance and support before being able to do their teaching unaided. So the zone moves in the GRR framework in four stages. The first stage, focused lessons, is where the student watches the teacher perform a task, a la observation. Next, guided instruction, wherein the student collaborates with the teacher on the task. After guided instruction comes collaborative learning, wherein students work cooperatively on the task, leading to the fourth and final stage, independent practice, wherein a student works on the task by his or herself unaided. Now, this is the framework we adapted for our nine-month teaching practicum. Our goal is to move our novice student teachers to the point where they can assume full responsibility for a 50-minute lesson with confidence and competence. So as you can see, the guidance and support within the zone of proximal development, it first comes for the, from the teacher trainer in those focused lessons. And then it comes from the peers before the student teacher performs the task unaided. Now, why is this so useful for a teaching practicum? Well, it limits the risk of swimming versus sinking. That is, successful implementation of new practices, swimming versus unsuccessful implementation, sinking, or the reversion to previously learnt and likely inferior practices. For example, a novice teacher may be likely to revert to rote memorization, an old teaching method, instead of trying to apply more active or interactive teaching methods. So the GRR framework is inherently scaffolded, allowing students to first observe the modeling of a lesson or lessons by an expert before collaboration and eventual independence, leading to student teachers gaining confidence in application before being tasked with an entire lesson and the many challenges therein. 
Moreover, students are able to differentiate the level of their lesson as they go through the GRR. Students are able to choose what teaching skills they would most like to focus on. And perhaps most importantly, the GRR framework assumes ongoing mentoring and support from the teacher trainer, be it through lesson planning and preparation or post-lesson coaching sessions. Therefore, student teachers receive ongoing, targeted feedback related to their own unique challenges in applying learnt pedagogy into the classroom. These challenges are addressed during the teaching practicum through the support of a teacher trainer so that once students enter their teaching placement, the in-service teaching, remember two-year in-service teaching internship, they have already addressed their most potent challenges in applying the new teaching skills. But of course, this requires the regular availability of a teacher trainer or a mentor to model, to support, to mentor, to coach, which is among several challenges facing the implement implementation of the GRR field experience in low resource contexts. It also requires a length of time substantial enough to allow for all four stages of the GRR framework. It also requires a teacher training curriculum based around teaching competencies for evaluation. And it requires an available school within which to hold meaningful field experience. Now, when I say meaningful field experience, I mean that the conditions within the field experience, the conditions within the teaching practicum, should mimic those the student teachers will find in their service teaching, in their two-year internship in our case. Now, it's time for some disclosure. This was hinted at earlier. All of our beneficiaries are in Myanmar. Our student teachers are ethnic Mon. They cross the border. They're from Myanmar. The parallel education system is in Myanmar. We have offices in Myanmar, but our program has existed since the year 2000 in Sankalburi, Thailand, because of security reasons. So while it would be ideal to have our field experience based in the actual schools our graduates will be teaching in, in that parallel education system, we do not have that fortune. Instead, since 2012, we've partnered with a local community school in Sankalburi, a school that's just a 10-minute walk from our teacher training facility. Now, this school provides Thai education, grades 1 to 3, to migrant youth from Myanmar. As the majority of our student teachers will be primary level teachers when they go back, the field placement age range, it aligns, as does the lower resource conditions of this community school. However, as this school is with the Thai government curriculum, the only subject our student teachers can regularly teach has been English as a second language, ESL. But it should be noted that English is actually a subject that is taught in Myanmar schools at the primary level. So it's meaningful for our students to be doing field experience in ESL. And it's useful for me, it's useful for my observations as well. But at the same time, it doesn't offer mother tongue based education opportunities for our student teachers. Nonetheless, the students' ages, the class sizes, the facility conditions at our teaching practicum site all closely align with the conditions our graduates will face during their service teaching. Now, our nine-month practicum with a, begins with assessments conducted by our student teachers and at minimum, at minimum, two focus lessons modeled by the teacher trainer, during which the student teachers observe and objectively note the actions of the teacher, the teacher trainer who is conducting the modeled lesson, and the students during the lesson. So the student teachers are watching the teacher trainer teach. They're taking notes about what he does. They're also taking notes about what the students do. A simple teacher, teacher does, students do. Now, these observations lead to our first post-lesson analyses wherein the student teacher observers 
the student teachers who observed the focus lesson, used their observations to deconstruct and evaluate the lesson with their teacher trainer. Now, during these post-focus lesson analyses, the teacher trainer is explicitly breaking down how he created the lesson plan and how students' notes reflect different components of the lesson plan. It is in these analyses that the teacher trainer is really explicitly modeling what pedagogy he took into account when crafting his lesson and unpacking these decisions. Now, the next stage, guided instruction, the teacher trainer is taking a step back and he's introducing opportunities for the student teachers to teach in teams. Now, together, the teacher trainer and teaching teams, which are pairs, are sharing responsibility of planning the lesson. The lesson is then delivered by the teaching teams, the student teachers who are working in pairs. And during this field experience, the teacher trainer is available for in-lesson coaching. But this in-lesson coaching must be delivered uninterrupted and as a means to guide the student teachers from critical in-lesson errors. Now, we're continuing to do a strong reflective component. Student teachers, they're required to write post-lesson teaching reflection essays where they self-evaluate their lesson. They identify high leverage areas for growth according to competencies that reflect what has been learned and the classroom component of the teacher training curriculum. And then lastly, post-lesson analysis and reflection is held, similar to lesson study, is held by the observing teacher trainer with the student teachers and their peers, the peers who observe the lesson. These sessions involve objective and subjective reflection, and they end with the teacher trainer individually identifying one big takeaway, a high leverage growth area for each student to implement for their next teaching practicum experience. Now, the third phase, collaborative learning, is much the same as guided instruction. The student teachers are working in pairs, only this time, the teacher trainer is even more removed. He's there in case support and guidance is needed, but he's not actively giving that. If the student teachers seek it, that's great. But the teacher is not actively involving himself in the planning of the lesson and the implementing of the lesson. Now we come to the end. This is the fun part. The students, they get to do it on their own. They're implementing independently. I love this part because not only am I impressed with the amount of swimming being done by our student teachers, but we also begin two other really great practicum opportunities. So we've got our weekly teaching practicum. We're also introducing after-school ESL classes over a five-week period with two classes a day. We're giving them even more opportunities to practice in the field, and we're also giving them the opportunity to do mother tongue-based storytelling at the same community school that have youth, migrant youth from Burma. So they're getting an opportunity to teach in Mon language and Burmese language in addition to the ESL courses that they've already been doing. So by the end of the program, our student teachers, they're much more confident and competent in applying their learned teaching skills across the three components of our teaching practicum. And so that's how we make use of our nine months of field experience. It involves quite a lot of involvement from the teacher trainer to support, to mentor, to observe, to coach the student teachers. But this investment, it really yields teachers who can better apply the best teaching practices they've learned. Teachers who can swim when they're put in the field. They have a stronger capacity to reflect on their lessons, evaluate their learning outcomes, and adapt and apply for future lessons. However, as exciting as this is, we still have work to do to measure the impact our teacher training has. While it is undeniable that our student teachers learn and improve during our teacher training, we must continue to monitor them during their service teaching to see if their teaching skills are being applied beyond our program. We take great effort to ensure that our student teachers swim during their 10 months with our program, but we must also make sure by using teacher competencies and evaluation that they're swimming when they go back to the parallel education system that's in remote and rural areas of southeastern Myanmar. Moreover, we must also see 
if this affects students' learning outcomes. I'm also curious to see if there's correlation between our graduates' presence and student dropout, teacher retention within the parallel education system. So we still have a lot of work to do with M&E, but I'm excited for the future. Our program is slated to move into Myanmar starting the next academic year in June, and we're moving forward with improved monitoring and evaluation of our 40 graduate teachers who are currently doing their two-year teaching internship. We've designed and hired a full-time staff who will provide on-site visits to the remote areas our graduates work in, and we're working with our parent organization who runs the ethnic education system, the Mon National Education Committee, to collect and share student exam scores. And that's how we're using the gradual release of responsibility framework for our pre-service teacher training. I must again mention that our teacher training, is, it's only about half of the total curriculum at the 10-month Boptal Education Empowerment course. Although we're in Thailand, our program is well positioned to partner with a local community school that sees the value in offering our student teachers field experience and also offers meaningful experience during our teaching practicum that are similar conditions to what our graduates will face back in Myanmar. And, excuse me, lastly, even though we have a low resource program, we have a dedicated teacher trainer or teacher trainers, and we have ample time, we've got 10 months, to devote to the demands, the time demands of the GRR framework. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have.